and welcome back to The Independent Pianist. I'm your host, Cole Anderson. As always, today's piece was a request from more than one person, actually. It was a request from a Patreon subscriber a while back. And also, I got a comment on a YouTube video by user Wise Pilgrim, and they requested the last movement of The Tempest. Actually, I'm going to be covering all the movements, but uh, since the request specifically was for the last movement, I'm going to start with that one. And there's plenty that can be said about only this movement, so I thought I would start with it and work backwards, as is fairly typical for me by now. Actually, what I sometimes do of uploading a multi-movement piece in reverse order is a little bit reflective of my practicing methods. I oftentimes like to start from the end of a piece when I'm learning it. Frequently, I run into students who play the first half of a difficult piece really well, and then they tend to have problems as they approach the end. So to counteract that, I find it's often a great idea to start practicing with the last sections, and it's just become kind of a habit for me. Starting the analysis of this sonata with this movement is a little bit problematic because this is one of Beethoven's most concentrated sonatas, motivically speaking. He didn't always write in such a concentrated way, but in this sonata, practically every motive in the piece is derived from the introductory theme of the first movement. The most important thing to realize is that the first theme in the first movement is in three parts, and each part has a different tempo. So we start in the absolute slowest possible tempo with Largo, and then we move on to a passionate Allegro, and finally there's an arresting of movement in an Adagio. An Adagio is not quite as slow as Largo. Each tempo also has its own motive. So with the Largo we have an arpeggiated chord. With the allegro, a descending line, divided up into groups of two notes. And finally, the adagio has an elaborate kind of turn motive. These motives turn up in various forms constantly throughout all three movements of the sonata. Particularly the arpeggio figure is extremely important. So most obviously you can see that it actually begins each movement in one form or another. But in addition to that, it also becomes gradually abstracted into an octave leap in various places over the course of the first movement, and then reimagined as a distant kind of drum roll in the left hand in the slow movement. So it sounds like this in the second movement. Then the arpeggio figure, along with the octave jump, takes over the figuration completely in the last movement. So as you heard, there is a continuous left-hand arpeggio figure in sixteenths, and the sixteenth motion continues uninterrupted through the entire last movement. And it's this figure in the last movement that gave me a good deal of pause when I was practicing this piece, because the way that Carl Czerny, Beethoven's student, recommends playing this in his excellent book on interpreting the Beethoven sonatas, which is also the way you frequently hear it played in concert and recording, is with a continuous pedal held through the first three bars, and then also through the following four bars. So it ends up sounding something like this. That's actually quite beautiful, and it has a very fittingly romantic sound to it. But I was intrigued by the notation of these bars, which Czerny doesn't mention. So as you can see, if you look a little closer, Beethoven writes the first two notes in the left hand with a doubled note head. So a sixteenth note and a dotted eighth note. This suggests two separate parts rather than only one accompaniment. So in theory, there's a bottom voice which sounds like this. and then an upper subsidiary part that sounds like this. <laughs> 
is for Beethoven a very typically orchestral way of writing what otherwise would look and sound like a standard arpeggio accompaniment. What isn't clear is to what degree this instrumentation of the left hand is supposed to literally sound through in performance. If you avoid pedaling starting from the first note of each bar, you get a quite different sound to the texture, uh, something like this. So this is much less romantic, of course, it's much more clear of sound, and to my ear it also brings out the complex orchestration in the left hand, at least to some extent. And then also you get a kind of beautiful contrast right where Beethoven marks the left hand to be sustained in a different way. Also, when the octave leap appears later on in the right hand at the end of the phrase, you understand immediately where that comes from in the accompaniment texture. So listen one more time to the entire opening theme played in this manner. working on this, I, I kind of liked that approach. On the other hand, I didn't know if I was just being too pedantic about it. You know, there's always a danger in taking the indications in the score too literally, and that can result in caricatured performances sometimes. And I'm always kind of on guard against things like that happening. So there are some cons to playing in this way. First off, it does remove some of the romantic sweep and intensity of the opening, and later on when the same figure occurs again in a louder dynamic, it's a little harder to justify this kind of drier sound. I oftentimes found myself using more pedal in some of the later occurrences of this uh, motive. So from that sense, it's a little bit inconsistent perhaps to do, to do this only sometimes and not other times. So I was just thinking about this and going back and forth about it, and I decided that uh, I really wanted to not only reference some recordings of this, but also just get the perspectives of my friends, uh, teachers, and colleagues, you know, to ask their opinions and see what they had to say. So I did. I, ha I emailed a handful of some of, my, uh, some of my friends, and I got some very fascinating and very different replies from these different artists. So my wonderful mentor from Oberlin Conservatory, who I studied with during college, was uh, uh, Peter Takac, and he has a wonderful complete recording of all the piano sonatas of Beethoven on Naxos, which is definitely worth checking out. So he was firmly on the non cherny side. He thought that you should play the opening with as little pedal as possible to bring out that texture in the left hand. And he even was pretty extreme. He, he was of the opinion that the entirety of the opening should be played with as little pedal as possible, with the only sustain really provided by the fingers, exactly as Beethoven notated. And of course you can hear a great example of that kind of interpretation in his recording of the sonata. Uh, something similar to this was also the opinion of my good friend Dr. Joel Schoenhals, a professor at Eastern Michigan University. Uh, he's also played the complete cycle of sonatas. Uh, he has a lot of experience with these pieces. You can check out his performances on YouTube actually of the complete cycle, which are very worthwhile and uh, very beautiful and interesting interpretations. And he did something uh, very similar to this and also uh, agreed with that point of view. On the other hand, my teacher when I was a teenager in Seattle studying at the Seattle Conservatory, uh, Mark Salmon, another veritable Beethoven expert, you know, he's played the entire cycle of sonatas at least once, and he's writing a book on Beethoven interpretation as well. He's a very fascinating personality and artist, and uh, he also has a series of lecture performances about various of the early sonatas available on YouTube. I think they're unlisted, so you have to follow links from his website, marksalman.net, but I have a link to them in the description box if you're interested. Anyway, he pointed out the motivic connection with this left hand and the later octave jumps in the right hand that I, that I just mentioned. I hadn't noticed that before, actually. It's, it's really fascinating. But he opined for himself that he had never been able to bring out the multi-voice left hand in a way that he liked enough. And he thought that Cherny's indication of pedaling in the opening probably indicated that this detail, 
is a compositional detail that was actually intended to remain beneath the surface of the performance. Visible in the score, but not necessarily audible in performance. Czerny at least did say, and he tended to be reliable, that he had studied the sonata with Beethoven personally, so one would assume that Beethoven would have brought this point up with Czerny specifically if you really wanted it to be literally audible. So that's definitely a very convincing argument as well in favor of the more romantic sound in the opening. Uh, my friend Joseph Jungen, a marvelous pianist who teaches at Frostburg University in, in Maryland, uh, had another very interesting take. He suggested that this notation might in fact be intended merely as a technical indication of how the opening should be played. So in other words, with the first note light and the second note sustained, calling implicitly for a fingering like 5-3-2-1, where your hand has to encompass a larger than an octave span, and it would be impossible to sustain the lower note in those first eight bars. This sort of figuration, it's true, was not all that common at the time Beethoven was writing, so maybe he would have felt some need to indicate that the first note is not meant to be held down at all. It was fairly common in that time to sustain the bass note of arpeggio figures longer than they were written. So it's perfectly possible that the whole explanation of this figure could be something quite mundane like that. It could be more of a technical notation. Then as well, you can hear some extraordinary things in various recordings. I'll just list a couple of the ones that I, that I looked at. The most eccentric version, which I actually came to quite like in its own way, because it's so daring and totally unlike any other recording, is none other than Arthur Schnabel. So he plays the first two notes almost faster than 16. So he kind of rushes them together so you can really hear the connection to the later octave leap. And it totally removes the romantic side to the opening. It gives it a much more edgy and nervous quality, but uh, that's kind of interesting and very daring how he did that. Uh, another striking technical solution is Daniel Barenboim. He plays the opening quite slowly in contrast to Schnabel, but he uses a very difficult fingering for these arpeggios. He uses his fifth finger for the first note, and then he jumps and uses the fifth finger again on the second note. So this is quite awkward, but most importantly, it forces the tempo to be slower and requires a break in between those notes. It's quite a clever idea to choose a fingering that eliminates the possibility of really uh, playing this arpeggio in the romantic way. On the totally reverse side is someone like Alfred Brendel, who I also really admire for his intellect and understanding, and uh, on his many recordings of this piece, he did a really beautiful job of delivering the more romantic, Czerny-esque version of the opening. Another recording that I do recommend, which came closest to what I eventually ended up doing, was uh, a studio recording by Svetoslav Richter from the 60s. I thought he got the opening pretty much perfect. The rest of the piece I play, I think, quite differently from him. I opt for more pedal and more of a tempestuous uh, style. His recording is pretty understated. Very beautiful in its way. So in the end, I did decide to bring out the left hand, not because I was necessarily completely convinced intellectually by one argument or another, but more because I was just very moved by the sound of it, by the kind of fragility and limpid quality that the opening takes on when you play it this way. The contrast that you get between the first few bars and later on when the bass is sustained is also just too beautiful and exquisite to my ear to pass up. So do I think this is how it has to be? Not at all. I think there's plenty of evidence supporting either version. So as long as you are aware of all the arguments for and against each and can make your selection intelligently, uh, partly with an intellectual basis and partly with a fine sensitivity for how you want the emotions of this opening to read, I think you're gonna be just fine selecting either version. Also, I feel it's worth defending Czerny a bit. He was quite a dependable and solid musician, and his advice in his book on Beethoven interpretation is usually very good. Uh, far better than the advice that you get from others at the time who purported to have a direct connection with Beethoven, like Anton Schindler. Anton Schindler was a complete charlatan most of the time. He didn't know what he was talking about frequently. Uh, he loved to take pot shots at Czerny's expense. Schindler wrote one of the very first Beethoven biographies, which was almost entirely fictional. 
and uh, you know even Beethoven referred to him as a total bungler. But even nowadays though, someone like Anders Schiff took exception with Czerny's story about Beethoven being inspired in this movement by the image of a horse and rider who apparently were galloping past his window. So Schiff, by the way, in contrast to this kind of interpretation, takes a very slow tempo in this movement. I think it's about uh, 52 for a measure. He also uses a lot of rubato. Uh, it's a very interesting interpretation. In my view, he exaggerates the allegretto marking in favor of a kind of very lingering interpretation. I certainly don't think this movement is supposed to literally depict the gallop of a horse, but I think this kind of insistent, perpetual 16th note motion and the continual intensity of emotion which is created by this and which is maintained throughout the piece suggest some kind of restless reiterated movement. So I don't think it's really too far off to imagine that it could have been inspired by the idea of some kind of relentless uh, pursuit on horseback. And I think that it has that in common with many perpetual motion finales which don't literally evoke the sound of a horse galloping. Charney's metronome marking is 76 for a measure and I think it's a very good one. It's, uh, some people play this much faster, some people play it much slower, like under Schiff. But I think that that tempo marking is actually entirely in keeping with various other indications that Beethoven gave for similar allegretto movements in his output. So at any rate, I've probably spoken enough for today about this movement. Only one more thing to mention is that the other two motives that I spoke about in relation to the first movement do indeed show up in this movement as well. The falling two-note idea. <laughs> in conjunction with the embellishment idea in the second theme of this last movement. So they're combined together like this. And later on the broken octave idea is also again incorporated into this same theme. So it's an extraordinary example of what we could call motivic economy. Everything really developed from that first theme in the first movement. But I'll go into more detail about the structure of the other movements in my follow-up videos which will be coming out over the next couple of weeks. So please enjoy the complete performance and do consider supporting the channel if you can, if you enjoy this content. It helps me to continue bringing you this, this content. So uh, you can do that easily through www.patreon.com forward slash independent pianist. I also have links to other methods of making a financial donation should you wish to. Also, if you're interested in studying with me, feel free to drop me a line at cole at independentpianist.com. I teach online and I still have some space in my studio left if you're interested in doing something like that. But in the meantime, please like the video, subscribe, and stay tuned next week for the next part of this sonata.